It's good to see all of you here today. I see a number of visitors here today. I, I'm tempted to call them out and ask them their name, but I won't do that. Because they'll never come back ever again. It's good to see you all here today. Are you guys enjoying going through Genesis? I'm glad you're enjoying it. Cause I'm, I'm learning things. You know, it's funny, the more you dig, the more you find. It's, uh, it's been a blessing for me. We're going to get back into the book of Genesis today. We're going to be in chapter 8. Of course, there's always the danger in knowing something that you already know and having somebody going to stand up and try to teach you about something you already know. You kind of say, yeah, I know that. <laughs> so I will try to surprise you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come here in your presence to look at your word, to learn of you, so that we might know something more about ourselves and how we should be toward you. I pray that you might give us wisdom and instruction today from your word, that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that you might reveal things to us, Lord, that Maybe we need reminding of or things that maybe we haven't addressed. Lord, this is our spiritual nourishment. Oh, Lord, how I need you. Every hour I need you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time with your presence, that your spirit would be stirred up inside of us, that you would help us to know you better and to be more like you. So, Lord, we dedicate ourselves and this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're back in the book of Genesis. And we're going to talk about their delivery. We, we talked about how God had orchestrated everything and brought the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to go around with a giant net, and isn't that a good thing, and catch them, but the Lord brought them two of each kind, except for certain animals, where there was seven of each kind. So you've got pairs, you've got, you've got 14 animals, seven in a pair, um, which we talked about last week. It's interesting because the Lord is the one who asked him to come into the ark, even as Jesus tells us. He says, come unto me, all you who are labor or weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a, it's a very similar thing, but the Lord is the one who welcomes us into the ark and calls us in. And the ark for us is, this is the audience participation portion. So the ark for us is, is Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the ark. He's the one that delivers us from the judgment to come, uh, the judgment that we would otherwise be caught up in. I'll try that again. So the ark for us is, Jesus. Well, that's so much better. I, I really enjoy that. That's good. I get to keep you active. We also see that there's also another invitation in the book of Revelation where John was asked to come up and come before the Lord, and the Lord began to unveil to him everything that we find in the book of Revelation. So it's interesting how the Lord constantly is beckon, beckoning us into his presence. We saw that it finally cut loose, that everything from above and everything from below this wonderful canopy uh, that God had created, which gave extraordinarily long lives to those who were earlier uh, in the scriptures, was collapsing, and the ground was opening up, and the, the waters of the deep were coming up, and how it rained, and it rained, and it rained. Some possibilities of how that was done, we understand that there's a mountain range actually right in the middle of the Atlantic and it kind of outlines between the two continents. And if you look at it, it looks a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. It may have been at this time that the Lord decided to separate the uh, continents as we know them. But Noah was lifted up and he was taken out of the way and the Lord is the one who shut the door, which is pretty good because then it doesn't sit on Noah's conscience that he did it. Because I can only imagine the banging and the crying and the pleading from outside the ark when it finally began to rain. And all of those who were outside wanted inside. But it was too late. They had made a choice and the Lord shut the door. And Noah was lifted up. 
as it ra rows about halfway, the, the, the ark begins to lift off and it begins to rise up. And he's actually lifted up out of the way of judgment, even as we will be in the last days. And suddenly, everything happened. And everything was destroyed on the earth, everybody that was there, and it prevailed for 150 days. I mean, you, you think it's bad if it rains on a weekend and you don't get to do what you want. <laughs> Imagine 150 days of rain inside of a floating zoo. We know from here there's only one ark. There's only one way of delivering, even as Jesus Christ is our deliverer. There was only one door. Jesus said that he is the door. He is the one in which we must enter to get to the sheepfold. It's the Lord who shuts the door. He's the one who decides the timing of all of this. And of course, they were actually ushered in seven days before uh, to kind of brace themselves and be ready. Everyone who was on board lived and everybody who wasn't on board died except for one, who was Enoch. And he was lifted up and taken away. He was no more because the Lord had taken him. A picture there again of the rapture of the church. So this week... We're going to be in chapter 8. It says that the ark rested in the seventh month and the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. So that's exactly what the scripture says. And by the way, it's the mountains, plural, of Ararat. There isn't just one. There's a, a whole range. It's uh, kind of like saying, you know, he, he landed in this region, not necessarily a particular mountain. So as we look at that, we'll pick it up from verse 1. And then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made him made a wind to pass over the earth and the, earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. So just when I imagine Noah's wondering if it's ever going to stop raining... For 40 days and for 40 nights. I mean, that's, that's a month and a third. That's a long time to rain. Uh, we've had a long time without rain, but imagine if we had rain all that time and stuck inside and hearing the storm outside and slowly the voices of those who were trying to get in subsided. And as the ark began to lift off and begin to float, it says there was a point at which all the mountaintops were covered and I imagine that was a time when he was really tested because you really have to trust God in the middle of a storm like that. You guys might be in the middle of a storm like that where you're wondering if God's ever going to come, if he's ever going to deliver. And so it happens that finally it stops. And that's got to be a huge relief to, to Noah and his family as they're inside the ark. It stopped. Good. Now where's all this water going to go? We'll have to wait and see. In Psalm 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, But you, O Lord, are my shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. What a delight it is when you cry out to God in the midst of your storm, and he answers your prayers. Amen? And if we went around, we, would have, we have tons of testimonies of how God has done that people that have waited f seeming forever until the right person comes along or uh, waiting forever for God to bless them with the miracle of procreation, uh, waiting for whatever it is that you're in the middle of, and God finally comes and delivers. Boy, what a great time that is. In Luke 23, verse 42, and then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's not like God said, oh, I totally forgot about Noah and all the animals. It says that the Lord remembered Noah. It's, it wasn't like, oh, I, I left something on the stove. I, what a silly thing. When God remembers, he is actively paying attention to, and there's always action followed by that. So it's an anthropomorphism. It's a, it's a way of speaking about God in a way that we understand. It's, but it's not like he forgot like we do. Uh, some of us who are old and ancient do. And the waters receded continually from the earth. In the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. The ark rested 
in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Boy, that must have been a good time, too, when it finally set down, when there was nothing but water, and suddenly they start to notice a, a strange rocking, and then a, that sound of kind of, maybe it was more of a squish, but settling down on the mountains of Ararat. Um, of course, you probably haven't been there, but there it is. Much of the year, it's completely covered with snow, as you see, because of the elevation. And it's a, a very difficult place to get to or get down from because of the weather. Uh, luckily, they were on the heels of having a, a different deal. Well, there's the old and the new calendar in the Hebrew. And the reason that this is important for us to determine what month and what day this thing sat down. The old calendar was different. And you remember when the Passover occurred when it, in Deuteronomy, he went and spoke to Moses and he said, this will be the first day for you. So this is the Jewish New Year. This is their religious calendar, not their civil calendar. And it's based on a lunar cycle. But anyway, you don't care about any of that. <laughs> so if we're talking about the seventh month, which is actually the first month of the, the new calendar, it's Nisan. And it's not a car, you know, it's not like a RAV4. <laughs> Nisan is the name of the, of the month. And it's the seventh month or the first month. And it's the 17th day. It's rather interesting. Because the 14th of Nisan is the Passover. And three days later is the 17th, which is the Feast of first fruits. And Jesus rose from the dead on this very day. Isn't it interesting that God set it up that way? That the writers of Genesis knew that. The writer of Genesis is the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you can do this. You get, it was a joke. <laughs> People are very slow. But the day that it sets on, it's an amazing thing. It's the very first day. It's the new beginning for, for Noah and all of the animals. And it's the very day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead when Mary and Martha go to the tomb and they find it empty and Jesus isn't there. That's the day. It's almost like a wink. That's what I call it when God does stuff like that. And it shows you that everything from Genesis to Revelation is God's revelation. None of it is contrived. None of it's a story. It all fits together. It all has purpose. And by the way, you can see a picture of the location of where this is up on Ararat. This is without all the snow. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots of evidence about where this thing is. You say, well, it's awfully far away. Well, yeah, it's far away. It's right on the border of Turkey and Iraq, so, uh, or Iran rather. So it's a very difficult climb and there are people that don't want you there for obvious reasons. By the way, the, the, not just recently, but all the way into antiquity, these folks all along the line have seen Noah's Ark. There were those who have taken parts of it and brought it back. There are pictures. There's all sorts of information that reveals all of this. So it's not, uh, it's not a strange thing or an unusual thing or even a recent thing. It's something that throughout history, people have been there, seen it, been in it, taken pieces of it and brought it back and evidence, um, much like the pictures that we have. So just to give you a preview of what's going on, here's, here's our, our timeline. They were in that thing for 377 days. That's a little over a year. That is a long time to be quarantined. Oh, wait, you might know something about that. <laughs> you know what it is when we were quarantined, they make you wear masks, you got to take a shot. You can't be anywhere near people. You got to keep three feet. No six feet. No 12 feet. No, never mind. Just don't go near people. Yeah. Except you probably weren't locked up with a bunch of animals. So, uh, or maybe you were. And the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen which tells me they were on a high mountain. They got dropped down first, and as the water went down, they began to see the other mountain peaks in Ararat. 
and the other mountains were seen. And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And then he sent out a raven. Well, he probably was raven mad at that point. He wanted to get out. He sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. Why did he send out a raven? To see if the water had drained up from the earth. It says right there. It's right in the context. It was a trick question. But why a raven? Makes me go. Hmm. He also sent out for him, from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And so he put out his hand, and he took her, and he drew her back into the ark to himself, and he waited yet another seven days. It's interesting. He's doing this on the Sabbath, weekly. God, please, I got to get out of here. And again, he sent a dove out from the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf. Everybody say olive leaf. Olive leaf. Good. Because everyone else thinks it was a, a branch. This little thing's not going to pull off a branch. It's a dove. It's got a little teeny beak. <laughs> but it is the universal sign for peace, is it not? A dove with an olive branch. It says an olive leaf. People don't read. <laughs> and it's everywhere. I couldn't even find a picture with, that, with a leaf. Sorry. A freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And by the way, olive trees actually will germinate and grow underwater for a period of time, which I thought was interesting. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and set out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. Lost his dove. Everybody go, oh. oh, good. Now you have compassion. That's good. So how many times did he send a dove out? Three. Three. How many times did he send a raven out? Did he get the raven back? No. It just flew around. Front of the boat, back of the boat. Ah! <laughs> Lost my raven. But see, and this is what everybody thinks of is this got a giant branch. He ripped it off and said, I got to bring this back to Noah. It was an olive leaf. In other words, found something to eat. There was, there was fuel out there. But the dove has a nature to come back, doesn't it? The raven, not so much. It might interpret your voice well, but it won't come back. It's interesting because in John 1, it says, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. We see that the Holy Spirit is likened unto a dove, correct? And so we begin to look at this dove and raven thing and say, hmm, okay, I think I can get the dove part because the Holy Spirit is like a dove and God uses sometimes these shadows and pictures very consistently in scripture. And he remained upon him. John saying, I did not know him, but that he would be sent to baptize. He sent me to baptize with water, said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I see also in Luke 10, five to six, a very strange scripture when he tells the disciples to go out two by two. And he goes, I don't want you to take money with you. Don't take a staff. Don't take extra shoes. Just, just go. Don't worry about your provisions. It'll be provided for you. They had to take a step of faith and do that. And every city where they went, they would have to find somebody to stay with. Jesus designed it that way so that they would have to trust God ultimately in everything that they did. And he says this interesting thing in Luke 10, 5 and 6. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. I find that interesting because it talks about this dove resting on, and we know that Noah's name is rest. It's interesting how this all kind of fits together. And, and if not, it will return to you. And it's, it's an interesting parallel to what's going on here in Genesis with the dove. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you go to a place and they seem to like you there, they want you there, then let your peace be there. In other words, don't bounce around. Don't go, well, what are they having next door for dinner? You know? <laughs> You just stay where you are and let your peace rest upon it and bless them 
while you're there. And so it's interesting how all of this kind of pictures the dove and the raven. And as I was trying to think about it, and I'm like, Lord, I know that there's something there, but what in the world is there? So we've got a raven, which is not a crow, by the way. They're subtly different, but they look the same. Interesting. Do you know what ravens eat? Carrion. Dead stuff. He put it in a much nicer way, carrion. <laughs> but you might think I said Karen, and then you'd, that'd be terrible. <laughs> so they, they eat dead stuff. The very fact that the raven went out and, and didn't find anything to eat is telling. Everything's cleaned up. But it didn't come back. It wasn't obedient. It's attracted to flesh. It doesn't eat, you know, off of olive trees. So I found that interesting in my research. Doves are very much vegetarians. They don't eat carrion. They don't eat dead things. And I thought, boy, that's, that's pretty significant. Because in the New Testament, Paul writes to us that we should walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And I find it interesting. And here's my question. Which bird are you attracting? You know, when we act out in the flesh, in, in our sinful nature, we tend to attract friends, activities, go to places that are fleshy. And I wonder what kind of bird is attracted to me. Will it be the Holy Spirit of God? Or will it be the flesh? I just thought that was an interesting thing that I hadn't seen before. In Galatians 5, verses 16 to 17 and verse 24, this is Paul writing to the church of Galatia. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So a raven should have no interest in you. And the dove should be part of what your life is about. Amen? Amen. All right. And it came to pass in the, in the 601st year of the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. And God spoke to Noah, finally, saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Notice God told him when to go in and shut the door. He didn't tell him to get out. So he goes up to his little window and he peeks and he goes, oh, this doesn't look good. And then finally it crunches down and he goes, oh, that's good. And then the water goes down even lower and he goes, I'm going to send out a bird. Sends out a bird, nothing. Sends out another bird, nothing. Sends out another bird, nothing. Sends out another bird, finally, that bird comes back with vegetation in his mouth, but he doesn't leave the ark. He didn't live by what he saw. He waited till God said go. Amen. I don't know how often you need to pray about things until things happen. It might be a fleshly prayer at first. <laughs> God, please take this away. And then maybe you, you gain a better heart and say, Lord, help me please, because I don't know if I can handle much more. And I think that's a picture of what Noah did in sending these birds. And yet he didn't do anything until the Lord confirmed it and spoke to him. This is a good thing to do. Amen. But finally, finally, he's 601 years old. He went into the ark, he's 600 years old. He had a birthday. Happy birthday <laughs> on the ark. You ever feel like, oh my goodness, time is passing by and God hasn't answered my prayer yet. I wonder if that's why it said, you know, he's 601 years old. 
like uh, he's not getting any younger. We might feel that way with our prayers as we lift them up to God, but God hears and he has a timing that's all his own. So it's time to take off the mask. The quarantine's over. Everybody's done. We can leave the ark. Hooray. So you understand how he must have felt, or at least have a small idea of how he felt. You know, we went through three years worth of disease and, and quarantine and crazy laws and everything else. But finally, he says, you can go. That's wonderful when God not only takes away everything and restores the earth back to where it's supposed to be, but then you guys can leave now. That's a good thing when God answers that prayer and you know that God answered that prayer. Amen? Amen. That's a good thing. Bring out every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. So they finally were able to get out of that stuffy, smelly boat. But that boat had served them extremely well. And it's a good thing it had pitch on the outside and on the inside because they had to shovel everything up every morning, I bet, as well as feed them. So it's 377 days later, finally, they're getting out of the ark. And I can imagine him cutting through that, that door that God had closed. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord. You know what an altar is? It should be a place where you're altered. An altar is a place where you're going to set up a sacrifice and worship God. It's called an altar, I believe, so that you understand you're supposed to be altered when you go there. It's supposed to change you. It's not appeasing God so he's not mad at you and throw a lightning bolt at you. You may have heard that somewhere, but it's not in the Bible. And that's not in ca keeping with his character. Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. The first thing that Noah did was to worship. And worship isn't just, you know, the musical portion of our service here in the beginning in the last song. Worship is everything that we do. Worship is living your life walking by the Spirit and doing that which the Lord would have you do instead of doing what you want to do. You know what I want to do? I can't wait till lunch. Is this guy done yet? <laughs> that sort of thing. Sometimes I say that to myself. But the first thing he did was to give thanks. And oh my goodness, didn't he have a lot to be thankful for? Don't you? Don't we all? It's a warm fall day. We're in an air-conditioned room. There's nobody here assaulting us. There's nobody shooting us. We're all alive and mobile, relatively. We have a lot to be thankful for. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Isn't it interesting? Ephesians using uh, the same language as the book of Genesis, the sweet-smelling aroma. If any of you wonder if God likes the smell of a barbecue, <laughs> because this is a burnt offering, by the way, and it's interesting, no one knew what a clean animal and a dirty animal was. And I imagine that coming off the ark, he's like, okay, you two over here. No, no, you guys over here. Okay, you guys can go. You can, no, you guys come over here. And he's sorting them out. And the clean animals were for sacrifice. That's why there were seven of each, male and female, each of them, that got on the ark. It's for sacrifice. And we're going to see in the next chapter, it's also for food. There's this sweet-smelling aroma of which Jesus Christ was to the Father. 
It says it pleased God to send him and have us kill him. Because he did it for us. He did it to purchase us. Because of our sin, we would never be able to enter heaven. We'd ruin the whole neighborhood. So Jesus came to take away our sin, to change us and make us as we should be. And that's the whole reason Christianity is here, is because Jesus became the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for our sin, so that we could be made right by what he did. And he was perfect, and we're just not. First thing about worship, it's going to be a sacrifice. The burnt offering was a whole burnt offering, by the way. The animal would be slaughtered, and then you would place the entire animal on the fire, and the entire thing burned up. The entire thing. Now, some of them, you get to carve off some of the nice pieces and roast it and eat it, and it's called a fellowship offering. You get to be part of that. So it's, hey, God, thanks a lot. And oh, by the way, we're going to share with you because this is cool. That's what we're going to do after church. We're going to have fellowship, which we're getting a piece of what God does. But the first thing you have to know about worship is it's a sacrifice. It's always a sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you hear it at weddings all the time. It's wonderful. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is gentle. It doesn't seek its own. It's not, not easily angered. It does not boast. You know, it goes on and on and on. Do you realize every single one of those things is a sacrifice? Just take patience. Patience means everything within you doesn't want to be doing this, but you're doing it anyway. That's what patience is. Waiting in traffic. <laughs> Waiting in line. That's patience. You're not honking your horn. You're not yelling at anybody. You're not rolling down your finger. No fingers <laughs> flying. So that's patience. That's what love is. Love is sacrifice. Bottom line, it's sacrifice. And that's what worship is. Interesting David, when he was getting ready to make sacrifice to God and giving thanks for getting back the ark, it says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 24, the king said to Aruna, by the way, Aruna was the guy, he wanted to buy his property and he wanted to set up an altar and he wanted to make a sacrifice. It ends up being Jerusalem, by the way. It ends up being on a hill. You might know it as the place where the temple ends up going. This is the threshing floor of Aruna. And the king said to Aruna, well, Aruna said, here, listen, you can have this land. I don't, it's cool. You can do whatever you want. And he says, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, that, which that costs, which costs me nothing. I will not offer anything to the Lord that I got for free. It has to cost me something. He understood something about worship. It needed to be important. It needed to be a sacrifice. That's what worship is. You guys are doing it right now just by being here. You set time aside. You don't go somewhere else. You come here. And you've dedicated yourself to hear the word of God, to worship together as a family. This is worship. For you guys to very patiently listen to the oddball up on the stage <laughs> is honoring to God. I just want to let you know I see that. And so the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night, shall not cease. That's got to be a great comfort to Noah that he doesn't have to build a boat again. It might be a great comfort to you to know that it's not going to end that way. God's not going to get sick and tired and say, every, every thought of the imagination of man is only evil continually. And he goes, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to come and flood the place. Actually, it's going to be by fire. We find this in the book of Peter. 2 Peter 3, 5 to 7 says, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. Peter said God created the land out of water and he also flooded with judgment the water, uh, with water. 
But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, which created everything and destroyed everything, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So God says, I'm never going to flood the earth again. I'll bring fire next time. I'm suddenly not comforted by this covenant with Noah. I hope you guys are enjoying as we go through. And I just, uh, for your point of interest, show you some of the things about the ark location and some of the things that they have found. Here are the ribs of Noah's ark inside. They also went and um, x-rayed everything. This is actually a piece of petrified gopher wood right here. This is one of the beams that they cut away and looked at. These are some of the structures that they found inside the mound, and, and here's a picture of it. You've got all of this evidence. Here's an aerial photo. Of course, you can't see it real well on the slides, but all of this found, and you guys can find it online. It's very easy to find. It doesn't take a lot of digging. Just put in Noah's Ark, and you'll find it. These are the structures they found inside of it. These are some of the wood beams, the petrified wood beams, which are on the side of, of that enclosure, just to give you an idea of, of size. So all of, all of this is readily seen. Here's, here's the bow of the boat here from inside of it. These are all the, the pieces that they have identified, and they actually did, uh, they did scans with radar, and they found all these things. So the, here's, here's the side of the boat. See the ribs? So this is, a real, this is a real thing. This is not fiction. It's not some story to tell uh, some other parable. It really happened. God really did this. Which tells me a couple of things. God brings judgment. And also, God has preserved a way for us to live. And it's in Christ. He is the ark in which we must enter because there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. I believe the time is ticking down and we don't have as much time as maybe you think you do. I'm looking at the structure of what's going on in our government. I'm thinking about Putin and him rattling his nuclear sword. He's, and he's in a desperate place right now. The fact that they're losing ground means he's getting desperate. And so, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Because you don't know if you'll get another chance. So once the door is shut, the door is shut. And you're going to have to live through a whole lot of tribulation. If you do know the Lord Jesus Christ, then per perhaps you've wandered away. Or there's compromise in your life. I would advise you and encourage you to get right with the Lord today because you may not have another one. Amen.